everyone! In this video, we are going to talk about the fact that Drayton Hall is widely considered to be the oldest and finest example of Palladian architecture in North America. Architectural historians, preservationists, and Drayton Hall superfans are usually impressed by this, but I believe this is something everyone should care about. If you are currently thinking that this makes for a good Jeopardy question, but not much else, I hope you'll give me a few minutes to persuade you. I should start by explaining that Palladian architecture takes its name from the 16th century Italian architect Andrea Palladio, who was inspired by the architecture of the ancient Greeks and Romans. His work became all the rage in the Veneto region of Northeast Italy when Venetian merchants found themselves suddenly having to try a new thing in the countryside. That is a whole nother video for another day. Fast forward a century later, and his work caught on in England. And then, guess where it landed next? Bingo! Many of the buildings you see every day are inspired by classical architecture. Go ahead and close your eyes and picture a bank, a college building, a church, maybe even some of the houses you drew for your stick figure people as a kid. I bet I can guess what a lot of your imagined buildings look like, and now you know that Drayton Hall was at the forefront of this style that is so ubiquitous today. See, that trivia is paying off already. Established in 1738 and completed by about 1750, Drayton Hall really is the earliest and finest Palladian building we know of in North America, and we think that it was designed by John Drayton. The evidence for Drayton's role in designing the house deserves its own video, so we'll save that for another day. But at the beginning of this video, I pose the question of why it should matter to us in this day and age that Drayton Hall gets this first and best award. Who cares, really? Well, consider the following. If you're fortunate enough to have choices about what your house looks like, you make very deliberate ones so that your house communicates something for you or about you. Think HGTV, Pinterest, Better Homes and Gardens. Everybody wants to help you get in touch with your personal domestic style. And you make all kinds of choices that reflect your preferences, your values, and your economic situation. John Drayton and his contemporaries were no different. Instead of home improvement shows and glossy magazines, Drayton had expensive books full of architectural designs and experiences visiting buildings he admired. Drayton used such resources to design an estate that communicates important ideas to us today, just as it did in the 1750s. One idea Drayton wanted to communicate was his taste for Palladian architecture, and Daniel Maudlin explains why this was so important in John's time. He says, in this carefully graded society where the demonstration of taste policed inclusion and exclusion from social groups, a conscious taste for Palladio and Palladianism was found only at the very top, the intellectual plaything of the very wealthy, and at that, only for those who enjoyed architecture as a pastime. Drayton Hall was also designed to demonstrate John Drayton's power. The house is inspired by a Palladian villa, and a villa is traditionally a building with a beautiful exterior that masks its real reason for existence, which was to create and maintain its owner's wealth and power. This was accomplished by the dominance of some people over others. How does a building do this, you might ask? You may remember learning about the classical orders in school and the different column types like Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. These are just some of many architectural details that exist within a hierarchy and were used to send signals about how important or exclusive some rooms were, and by extension, the station of those who were allowed to enter such rooms. These architectural cues helped reinforce the idea that society was hierarchical and that everyone existed in a world in which some people dominated and others were dominated. And this idea of using architecture to compartmentalize people went way beyond column capitals. Here's a plan of the main floor of Drayton Hall, where you can enter the house through one of three doors on the portico. Consider this while I read a quote from Palladio himself. He says, The architect ought above all to observe that for great men 
and particularly those in a republic. The houses are required with loges and spacious halls adorned that in such places those may be amused with pleasure who shall wait for the master. And for gentlemen of a meaner station, the fabrics ought also to be less, of less expense, and have fewer ornaments. So that's one big fancy room for the really important people and two plainer ones for those of a meaner station. But that still leaves entrances in the cellar as well as two detached wings for receiving people that didn't merit a trip up the portico stairs in John's estimation. This is starting to get complicated, I know, but there's more. In this photo, you see an interior cellar door that we analyzed by taking tiny paint samples and studying them under a microscope. What we saw told us even more about how architecture was used to compartmentalize people. The side you can see faces into a room that we believe housed enslaved people in the main house. It has plain flat panels and its surface was left completely bare for a long time so that it collected lots of dirt and grease before it was finally whitewashed. The other side of the door that faces the more public space in the cellar has a more attractive raised panel look and had an oil bound paint applied as soon as it was installed. So we know that the more public side of the door once looked markedly better than the side that faced the living space of enslaved people. This is a sketch made by John Drayton's son, Charles, in which he's reworking the spiral staircase that you can see in the house today. He referred to it as the private stair, but it was largely the domain of the enslaved people in the household. You see here that he writes, Perhaps it is better to make the landing communicate with one bedchamber door only. He's clearly thinking about access here. As enslaved people moved about the house by way of this staircase, they were granted access to private spaces by means of these landings, and Charles was considering what level of access he wanted to permit. Okay, so we've just covered a lot of ground. Let's sum up. As John Drayton thought about the headquarters of his plantation empire, where his wealth and power relied on the subjugation of other people, he considered the houses of ancient Roman enslavers and the exploitative landowners of the 16th century Veneto. He may have convinced himself that the hierarchies and order embodied in classical architecture and the claim that these rules were not of man, but of nature itself, meant that his dominance over the people he enslaved and his elevated status above free people of a meaner station than his own were also quite natural. He considered all of these things and said, yeah, a Palladian villa will be perfect. Let's do that. And then an entire generation followed suit. Centuries later, we continue to build great buildings in this same architectural tradition without much thought to the reasons our forebears found them attractive. You may have seen this issue raised in the national news earlier this year, but whether you did or not, I hope this video offered some new insight into the historical significance of our architectural claim to fame.